it's listen and learn and uh, today's topic is intersectionality. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker for the session, just a little bit about uh, intersectionality and um, I was talking to uh, to Laura before we joined uh, earlier on and I would say that it's often the almost like the forgotten protected characteristics. I think as organisations we're so and rightly so, so intent on ensuring that we have um, equity and equality for our people and targeting those protected characteristics to ensure that we're doing the best we can for the people that we work with and, and the people that we serve, that we often forget that um, we're not all just made up of one protected characteristic. We're in fact made up of many different things and that in itself is, is absolutely our intersectionality. I think intersectionality begins to bring together the whole person, um, but it also begins to highlight the compounding effect of inequality in some particular cases. So, you know, a black woman, uh, a black lesbian woman, a black le lesbian woman with a with a faith. Again, you're then beginning to see the compounding barriers, um, the complexities of those barriers, uh, and indeed the discrimination that um, somebody with a number of protected characteristics might indeed face uh, within a work environment, but also in a societal one as well. But that's just a brief intro. Um, I've got the great pleasure of welcoming, um, looking on my screen, she's here. She's um, Laura Summer and she is from Inclusive Employers. So welcome, Laura, and over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lovely, thank you so much. So my name is Laura Summers. I'm one of the senior inclusion and diversity consultants at Inclusive Employers. If you haven't heard about us before, we work with organisations um, across the country and globally to support um, organisations in their inclusion and diversity journeys, whether people are at the start of that and just starting to think about it through to organisations that have been doing this for a number of years. Um, fundamentally, we're a, a member organisation and we have a few fire services as members at the moment who we work closely with and support. But we deliver um, webinars like today, training, culture reviews, qualifications. Basically, if it's something to do with inclusion diversity, we're either doing it or we're currently developing it. Um, just a note on terminology. As I'm sure you're all aware, language is constantly changing. We do our best at inclusive employers to uh, be as up to date and inclusive as possible with the language we use. But we appreciate that descriptive language is not always universally agreed. Um, so I don't think there's any kind of terms that are coming up today. Um, that are kind of too controversial or being debated at the moment. But we always say when you're having those conversations with your friends at work, with your team members, always be led by the words most commonly used by the communities themselves. Um, as with any kind of umbrella terms, it's good to acknowledge that they're, they're not always used by everybody. So always be kind of led by that person with lived experience. The aims of the sessions that I deliver acknowledging that we have kind of an, an hour max. We're not going to get through everything. We're not going to leave this being amazing experts on intersectionality, but we will have a really good stab at looking at the basics, the concepts, and also how that applies to you in the workplace. So my aim is that you either learn something new or that you go away and you've consolidated some information that you already knew about, because it's always nice to know that we're moving in the right direction and that our learning is up to date. So as you're going through today, just have a little think about, oh, I didn't know that. or Oh, I knew that. And now I feel more confident about it. Um, and then I'll know I've done done my job at the end of the session. So what we're going to cover, uh, we're going to look at the definition of the word intersectionality and its roots. So we really understand where the concepts come from. We're going to have a think about why it's important to think about our colleagues, also ourselves, through an intersectional lens. Have a think about what we can do as individuals and organisations to embed a more intersectional approach in our work and also in our systems, our policies, our procedures. And then a look at the impact that you can expect to see when we take this approach. So, quick question. What is intersectionality? What does that word mean to you? And it's fine to say, Laura, I've never heard of it before. That's why I'm here. I don't know. Or you might have a sense of it. You may have heard it somewhere at work, in the media. OK, so we're going to have a look at the roots of where intersectionalities come from, because I find 
I, inclusion and diversity kind of hot topic words. We tend to see them um, in the media, we, we talk about them, but sometimes we don't actually know where they've come from. Often we, especially in the UK, we sometimes adopt terms, phrases from the US, which maybe don't translate directly into to the culture that we have here. Um, so it's always good to really know where something's come from and the reasons why the work's um, been established and developed and how it kind of relates to today. So on the screen, you'll see uh, in the bottom right hand corner, we have a photo and this is a uh, professor uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and Kimberly is an American civil rights advocate and a leading scholar on critical race theory. She is a professor at the UCLA School of Law and Columbia Law School and uh, her work there specialises in race and gender issues. And she's really been um, leading the way in this research. Um, critical race theory emerged in the uh, 1980s and 90s among a group of legal scholars um, of which Crenshaw was part of. And this was in response to um, a lack of recognition in the legal systems and structures themselves and thinking about whether those systems and structures themselves could be racist rather than just kind of neutral institutions that had racist individuals working within them. And she uh, wrote a paper in 1989 um, that's called the Demarginalising demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, which I always struggle to get, get my mouth around. And she uses intersectionality um, in her quote, as a prism to bring light um, to dynamics within discrimination law that weren't being appreciated by the courts. And this paper um, was really significant in the start of um, the work around intersectionality. And it's really important to note that the work that kind of started in the 80s and 90s was preceded um, by conversations around intersections between different characteristics back in as early as the 1960s. And back when those conversations started, it was really looking at the feminist movement in the United States and looking at the different experiences of white middle class women within that feminist movement compared to black working class women as well. So if this is something that Piques your interest, you really, you know, like to learn more, really start looking at um, kind of what was going on in that feminist movement in the 1960s. And all of that really influenced the work that Crenshaw started with colleagues in the 80s and 90s, applying similar thoughts to the way that kind of law and justice system was working in the States. So the paper that came out, the, the really significant paper, it centered on three legal cases that dealt with the issues of both racial discrimination and sex discrimination. Um, and those cases were uh, De Graff and Reed versus General Motors, Moore versus Hughes, Helicopter Inc, and Payne versus Trevenal. And so these were really kind of significant cases um, in the States at the time. And in each case, Crenshaw argued that the court's really narrow view of discrimination was a kind of a prime example of really limiting down kind of the concept of discrimination to, to single issue analysis. So thinking just about one particular characteristic. And she looked at how the law was considering both racism and sexism, but didn't see how those could overlap and kind of intersect together. So in other words, the law seemed to forget that black women are both black and female, and thus subject to discrimination based on both their race and gender, and often the combination of the two. Um, and the uh, General Motors case in 1976, um, was a really interesting one that, that she really dives into in this paper. So there were the five black women, they sued General Motors because um, they had a seniority policy um, that they argued targeted black women exclusively. So basically the company simply did not hire black women before 1964. And that meant that when they started to have seniority based layoffs, um, which were around kind of the 1970s during a recession, all of the black women hired after 1964 were subsequently laid off because they hadn't had that opportunity to build up that kind of long term service and that level of seniority that their, their white female colleagues had. And so this policy, Crenshaw argues, didn't just fall under gender. It didn't just fall under race discrimination, but that combination. Um, 
but the way that kind of the law and the courts were set up at the time didn't allow for that to be acknowledged. Um, so this work really was kind of the basis of um, the term intersectionality and where all the work that has evolved since the um, kind of 70s, 80s and early 90s has evolved. And as we've moved the thoughts around intersectionally much wider now into conversations like we're having today, thinking about the workplaces that, that we are in, thinking about the communities we live in, our own lived experience and that of other people as well. And it's quite interesting um, that recently we've seen kind of some resistance to intersectionality or the phrase intersectionality or people's perceptions of what they think that means. Really, when we kind of move away from all of the complex work that, that Crenshaw was doing and, you know, thinking about law and, and justice in, in a very kind of formal way, intersectionality quite simply is a tool we can use to help us understand and empathise with our fellow colleagues and human beings. It's a lens in which we can really begin to understand the experiences of other people. Um, so it's really about kind of having that human centred approach to understanding the differences we come across and it's about acknowledging that we have overlapping intersection intersecting identities and that we're really like three-dimensional beings aren't we we're not just one thing if we you know just think about our own selves for a moment and I'll give me as an example I'm a I'm a woman I'm white I'm neurodivergent I'm queer I have a chronic illness and some disability so oh lots of fun things um so I'm not just one of those things they all impact on each other and I can't just box them off even though that would be quite nice sometimes to do that um, and as you can see on the screen we've got um, we're kind of showing intersectionality in this diagram with the overlapping circles and what we tend to find is that people that have more overlapping identities um, and identities that tend to be more marginalized in society they're more likely to be on the receiving end of discrimination and microaggressions and um, victimization as well so going back to what was talking about right at the start you know thinking about um so you know if someone's a woman a person of color maybe they have a really strong faith they could be disabled if they're in an environment where any of those parts of their identity are more marginalized uh they're probably more likely to be on the receiving end of some discrimination and discussions you know around intersectionality have really grown which is great um, and they've really gone beyond that legal setting that, as i was saying that it was created in but like anything, when we start having more conversations about things, we often see some resistance because we're asking people to maybe think in a new way or change that, you know, some understanding that they, you know, they've had for a very long time. Um, and when I talk about intersectionality, I always like to ask people to just reflect on who they are and think about their overlapping identities, all the things that make up who they are, um, because they're just as equally as important as those of everybody so intersectionality and having you know that embedded into our ways of working benefits everyone including yourself um and the resistance we're seeing is coming through kind of sometimes in media sometimes in different areas of government around policies and ways of moving forward um but we have so much evidence that really proves that um those overlapping experiences cause increased discrimination um but what we see is that people don't aren't kind of centering that as their understanding instead we see a lot of conversation around um kind of the opinion that intersectionality is deprioritizing people that have already have certain levels of privilege for example um it's kind of taking white men who may be at the top of a um hierarchy for example and flipping that and moving them to the bottom um so they believe that this proposed hierarchy isn't kind of creating equity for everybody but rather kind of removing um benefit for people and replacing them um, with people that have kind of been underserved previously, which is not what intersectionality is about at all. And if you can see on here, this kind of demonstrates it quite nicely. If we just think for a moment, if we're in a society where we maybe have our black LGBT women at the bottom, so they can maybe face discrimination because of each of these intersecting parts of their identities. Um, we've got some women and black men here who may be a little bit more privileged, maybe not 
you know on the receiving end of so much kind of um, hard work and discrimination and, and trying to get where they they want to be and then we can perhaps say have our, our white straight men at the top not to say that they haven't worked really hard but you know our structures are probably there to you know set people up for success and kind of some of the narrative is, is saying oh intersectionality that that flips it's on its head we're going to re replace those men with the black lgbt women at the top and that is not what intersectionality is about so if i ask you to take one thing away from this session today it's that understanding that it's not about removing opportunity from anyone it's about understanding how we have lots of things that make up who we are sometimes that means we encounter more discrimination what can we do to make sure that everyone has an equitable experience and has that opportunity to grow and flourish in the workplace come to work feeling you know that they belong that they're accepted that they can grow in their careers and how can we as allies, you know, step up and support people, <clears throat> question discrimination. It's about treating humans for who they are and having empathy. Um, so if you hear anyone kind of having a wrong interpretation, please have those conversations with them and, and help them in their understanding of what intersectionality truly is. Um, it's not about treating people badly. It's about making things good for everybody. So we're going to have a little thing um about what makes up who we are i've already kind of shared a little bit about some of the things that make up who i am um but for this exercise we're going to use the nine protected characteristics that you may have heard of from the equality act 2010 in uk if we have anyone from wales i know that the welsh language and deprivation is also included as protected characteristics in wales and if you're in other locations or may have lived abroad um, i lived in the us for a while there's different kind of characteristics that are focused on in the US, for example, veteran status, genetic information, so medical family history, really important ones there. So we've got age, sex, sexual orientation, gender assignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, marriage and civil partnership, religion and belief and disability. So when we it comes to diversity and inclusion, we often think about these, as we were saying at the start, as kind of standalone individual characteristics. And in the workplace, we tend to have action plans in place to address discrimination for each of those. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the law, I think it took about 116 different pieces of legislation and, and whittled them down into the Equality Act we know now. It does a pretty good job of covering, you know, the significant things that tend to impact people. But those aren't everything. Um, we're made up of so much more. So if you were kind of redesigning your Equality Act and if you're thinking about your lived experiences and the things that have an impact on how you've progressed through life, what else do you think we should be considering? So there's so much, isn't there, um, that we should be considering. And that's not to say you need kind of a policy and approach um, for every every single one of these that we just talked about but it's just having that kind of general understanding of the different types of impact on people the impact on how they live their life the access to education you know how some of those issues may impact their access to work but also their time within work as well you know thinking do we have policies for people that are carers that are going through um, fertility treatment you know are we only seeing our senior leaders that have really you know clear cut classic um kind of queen's english or are we hearing the wonderful diversity in accents um are we seeing diversity of color of race so there's so much that makes up who we are and so whilst the equality act is fantastic and i would say it's you know the baseline for organizations to get that right we can be taking that further we can be thinking about how all these other things affect who we are because not only do they maybe sometimes bring up issues for us, but all of these different experiences and the diversity of experience brings so many positives to an organization. It brings, you know, innovation, different ways of thinking. You're probably more um, reflective of the communities that you serve as well. So having understanding of how communities like to be communicated with, how um, their, their understanding, their relationships with, with fire service, with other organizations. Um, so it can really give you um, a lot of kind of intel if you have that really diverse group of people working for you and, 
you have the systems in place for those people to contribute their their opinions, their ideas, get involved in how you're developing as organisations. So we're just going to have a, a little think about how um, language really influences our worldview. As I've I've mentioned, you know, I'm definitely as I've grown older and I've become, you know, really involved in this IND work, I've become really aware of the influence that language had on me as a child, and that's language used by my parents in schools, the kind of media I was consuming. Um, and even now, like, thoughts will crop up in my head and I'll be like, where has that come from? And inevitably, I can track it back to something I maybe heard when I was younger, um, or maybe heard someone I really trusted saying. Um, so language really influences our, our view of the world and the people in it. And, and this can really relate to our understanding of intersectionality. So we've chosen sport as an example because um, it's something lots of people are interested in. If you're not interested in it, you've probably heard of it. You're probably forced to pay it a bit when you're at school. Um, but we can apply all of this to other areas um, and different sectors of life as well. So we use lots of gendered language day to day without kind of really thinking about it and this can really impact on our interactions with other people so we want to be paying attention not only to the language we use but also um, be thinking about kind of the impact that, that it can have in the long term like the general message that it's sending out to people and whether it's getting kind of the engagement that you want um, so this is from a study that the Cambridge University Press did um, around language used to describe Olympic athletes during um, the 2016 Olympics by the commenters. Um, so as you can imagine, you're commentating on the Olympics, like the biggest sporting event globally, millions and millions, probably billions of people tuning in. And these were the words that were selected to describe people. So for man, we had win, strong, mastermind, dominate, beat, battle, fast. For women, we had married, compete, participate, unmarried, strived and aged. These words initially, you know, they're not gendered words in that sense. You know, they could be applied to either gender here. And I appreciate we are just talking on, on a bit of a binary here with the genders. Um, but those commenters were leaning towards using particular words for men versus women. So, yeah, I think it's really interesting how for the women, you know, their relationship status was really important. You know, they could be winning the 100 metre race, you know, the fastest women. But, oh, we're concerned whether they're in a relationship. Um, we've got kind of strive, participate, which... If I think about those words and my interpretation of them, it's striving, participate. It's like, oh, you're giving it a good go. Oh, you're trying hard to get there. As opposed to like win, beat, dominate for men. I think it's growing up, we've learned like society has always kind of had this view on women versus men. So it's kind of embedded in the way. And I bet if you spoke to these commentators about it, they'd be quite shocked. So it just shows how easily language can kind of influence, especially when we're kind of looking out and thinking how far and how widely spread and all the people this is reaching. So we're thinking here about men and women, but if we start to think about looking at this even further through an intersectional lens, um, we know um, through research that women in sport experience a disproportionate level of interest in their appearance and whether they kind of fit into the norms of femininity. And we know that particularly black athletes have can have amazing pace, power, natural ability. And that if they have that, it's really emphasised. And in comparison to, um, you know, white people, um, th there tends to be a real kind of comparison that's really kind of driven by race and particularly when it comes down to women. So, you know, for black women in sport, this combines into kind of a focus that looks at their appearance, what we believe femininity is, um, power and pace, and that often results in comments around black women being too muscular, too masculine, more aggressive. And essentially what that does, it um, compares 
this to this idea of what white femininity is, which is the, the striving, trying really hard, maybe not being as powerful, maybe not being as visually muscular. So we're getting not only are we looking at kind of a, a gender difference there, we're then getting into that intersection of kind of race and our opinions about kind of what women should be and look like. So it's really quite complex. And we've really seen how you know, without thinking intersectionally, without reflecting on the language that we're using, we can send out a message that can be quite negative, negative to the people that we're talking about, but also to our audiences that we're reaching out to. And if you think about that and flip it into our workplaces, you know, um, you will represent really diverse communities in the work that you're doing. So if we're using language that is sending out a negative message, then people are less likely to engage with, with the core of what we want to tell them, which often fire service is about safety. You know, it's about keeping people safe. So we, we want to be thinking about one aspect of intersectionality is understanding our communities, understanding the issues that come up for them and how we can talk to people in a positive way that, you know, gets them really, really engaged. So there was a video just before Christmas that came out on social media. I forget which brand did it, but they sat down. Um, oh, I'm really not into football, so I apologise. I do not know these people's names, but it was someone from the women's uh, football team, British football team, um, who now commentates, and then um, a male player. And they basically swapped social media and were looking at each other's comments that they were getting. And it was, it was really eye opening. Um, I will try and find the link and send it over later for you um, because annoyingly, I can't remember their names. But yeah, really interesting insight. Sport is a fascinating world. We do a lot of work with sports organisations. Thank you, Jill Scott and Gary Neville. Thank you. Thank you. You are right. Yeah. Have a Google. It will come up for you. OK, so let's bring this back into the workplace now and think about why it's important consideration for inclusion and diversity work. So as we've looked at, we don't experience the world based on one characteristic. Individuals often have more than one. Um, and often if they have more than one, then there's going to be at least a few where there's the potential for discrimination and hostility. And it's important to be aware of intersectionality so that we recognise that an experience is unique for every single individual. Yes, some of us will have similar experiences, but there's always going to be those elements that are slightly different. So what impacts might intersectionality have in the workplace? So just take a moment and see if anything kind of comes to mind for you there. So as you can see, it's a really varied, isn't it? Down to, you know, the actual kind of processes and access to promotion, even recruitment at the start, but promotion, those opportunities can be related to, to your identities and those intersections, down to kind of those feelings, um, you know, your own confidence, the impact it has on, on your mental health as well. Um, yeah, we've got kind of code of conduct application to neurodiverse folk. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I'm finding that's coming up with a lot of organisations I work with, having to support them on developing those policies to be more inclusive. Yeah, older women perceived as losing their touch um, versus older men seen as having great experience. I have lots of conversations about that at board level with organisations. Yeah, 100%. Brill. So let's have a little look in a bit more detail and summarise some of our thoughts here. So policies and procedures are a really important one. You know, are your policies and procedures inclusive of all identities? Have you had an equality impact assessment on them? Um, I, in this current role and in my previous role, have been really heavily involved in, in reviewing policies and procedures and benefits. And um, one example I can give, I used to work for the Health Foundation. And when I joined, um, it's an organisation that was 97% white people, 75% um, women, 80% 2% Oxbridge educated. Um, I gathered all these stats, which is why I can never recite them off by heart. So it's a really particular group of people that had very similar experiences. And so they had policies that were written that fitted those identities. So if we're thinking about our benefits, for example, we had as part of that, they had a nice membership to a nice fancy gym that was next to the office in London, central London. Um, pandemic hit, we started to diversify the organisation, people moved away from London, people were impacted by COVID. And when we looked at this policy, we were like, that's lovely, that's a lovely benefit, but 
does that apply to everybody? So we ran some focus groups, brought together people from our network groups. So we had a really nice uh, mix of people looking at this and saying, you know, if you were to rewrite this policy, what would it look like? How can we make it inclusive so that this benefit is a benefit for everybody? And we landed on not taking that fancy gym membership away from everyone. That was still an option. Or you could claim up to £50 a month for something that gave you a benefit to your physical or mental health. So I paid for a dance lessons with it. My colleague did pottery because they had arthritis and it helped keep their hands mobile. So it didn't cost us any more money. Uh, the board signed it off, but it meant that there was that personal choice and that that benefit applied to everybody by making a really simple change. So if we'd not done that, that old policy would have just carried on benefiting certain people. Um, but we were able to kind of open that up. And I think that can be applied more widely, you know, when we're thinking about, I think people mentioned uh, kind of code of conduct discrimination, you know, um, what where why have we landed on this you know why why do we use these particular words are we asking for certain types of behaviors that you know may cause issues but be harder for people uh, that are neurodivergent um if we look at our maternity paternity adoption policies are they inclusive for lgbt parents for example so it's really helpful if you don't already do them to um look at equality impact assessments for your policies because they enable you to think about all of the different intersections of your staff members and also get people with lived experience involved in those as well um and they can really help you kind of guide on those and then it comes into play with our everyday interactions as well. So thinking about how those from underrepresented groups could potentially be excluded from everyday interactions and activities. For example, say we uh, managed a team social in an underground bar. Um, a Muslim colleague or someone that doesn't drink may not wish to attend because it's in a bar. However, if that colleague that doesn't drink is also disabled, you've just popped in an additional barrier because it's in a basement and they may not be able to get down there. So, again, just even these simple things thinking about oh, while wow, we're arranging this, let's find somewhere that is inclusive for everyone. That's not to say you never go to the pub and have a drink. That's totally fine. But just having those options for people. That also applies to where are our meetings, uh, the time of day that they're being held. So we always having a meeting at, I don't know, half past five on a Friday. I'm sure you wouldn't do that. You know, parents, carers may have need to, to leave and not able to get involved in that activity. So just having that kind of thought, that reflection can really help to start to have that intersectional lens coming through in the way in which you're kind of running the organisation. Hey, disparities, a few of you uh, picked that up. Um, so then are not only pay disparities with single characteristics, so we report in the UK if you're above a certain number of employees on our gender pay gap, lots of organisations are now starting to look at race as well. Um, but when our single characteristics are combined with other minority characteristics, pay disparities increase further. So the London School of Economics uh, did a report recently and they discovered that black women are least likely, least likely to be among the UK's top earners compared to any other racial or gender group. And while women experience substantial differences in pay, hours and representation and top jobs generally, it's the black women who have the lowest probability of being those top earners. And in the UK, there's also the class gap in terms of socioeconomic background and class, and, and that's around 13%. And this pay gap widens even further when ethnicity and gender and socioeconomic status are combined together. So if you have the capacity, then I would suggest um, looking into those intersectionalities within your pay gaps as well. That's not saying you need to publish this you know externally if you don't feel comfortable to but it's insight it's helping you understand what's going on with the organization and enabling you to then have change and remove that disparity for people then you also pulled this out in the chat which is great development opportunities so people may make assumptions about who's suitable for certain courses um for example it might be assumed an older colleague might not want to go to an advanced it course for example um but what if that colleague also their second language um, was english for them that might create even more bias against whether that person's chosen or not um and this of course would be discrimination um it could be called out for discrimination but it 
gets us thinking about how some colleagues may potentially have more opportunities for development than others too. Um, I was having a chat just yesterday about how um, the organisation I was chatting with, they're really struggling to, they kind of said, oh, there's a mentoring opportunity. It's available for everyone. Just sign up if you want to. Um, but I was saying, you know, I was brought up, I was never encouraged to put myself forward for things. Um, my mum was always like, just be in with everybody else, be with the group, don't stick your head above above the parapet. So I would never have just put myself forward for something. I would have waited to be asked. It's only now as I've had great mentors and discovered I should put myself forward for things that I would do that. But I said, you know, just by having a blanket, everyone can apply. It's just, you know, if you want to. Sometimes you need those more kind of focused um, conversations with people. You need to encourage people to go for opportunities, create opportunities that speak to people, understand what your staff need. So really thinking about how are we, you know, building those relationships with people to help them with their career development. Um, and then we have well-being and turnover rates. So as I've mentioned a few times, those individuals that have identities facing multiple forms of discrimination could potentially face more challenges in the workplace too. And that can impact on well-being and work and perhaps sickness and turnover rates. Uh, the mental health charity Mind, um, they've done a lot of research around the intersectional impact on mental health. Um, and in their research, they've found that some LGBT individuals may face challenges in their lives that other um, LGBT people don't face. So even people within that same community face different challenges. Um, and this could be um, types of discrimination, such as like social exclusion, so social disadvantage, cultural and identity conflicts. Um, so when we're thinking about our wellbeing initiatives as well, it's, um, I, you know, that one size fits all doesn't necessarily fit even just for one, you know, characteristic. So thinking about having those options, thinking about how can we build things out? Um, so, for example, if you have an employee assistance program, does that provider demonstrate an understanding of intersectionality? We've just been finding a new one for ourselves at Inclusive Employers, and that's been a real key question we've been asking. And often they, the organisations haven't even thought about that. So do question the organisations because it gets them to change and improve as well. You know, if, if we're thinking about EAPs, if we're signposting our staff to counsellors, if they need support, are those counsellors knowledgeable about the importance of cultural and social context when supporting those individuals? So just kind of summarising around taking action, you know, we need to, in our organisations, understand the importance of intersectionality. If we aren't being intersectional, we aren't seeing the whole picture. We're not providing the whole service. We're not going to be reaching out um, to people that we want to. And we need to start from a position that recognises intersectionality for any strategy, any projects. Um, and one tool that we've been talking about is those equality impact assessments. And make sure that, that your framework for that includes intersectional questions. Um, we have a, a template, so feel free if anyone needs help with this, get in touch with me after the session. Um, data collection and presentation can be really helpful but be looking at your data again through that intersectional lens. Um, so we sometimes think, like we were saying with our pay gaps, we just look at gender, we just look at race. Well, actually, what if we look at the impact of race and gender together? So thinking, how can we drill down into this data even further? Um, and that data can then can help you make decisions and you know you can justify where you're spending and your spending and your budget is going. We want to understand intersectionality so that we can deal with any bullying and harassment and to enable us to deal with that. We need to have, you know, clear values and behaviours um, in our workplace. We need to educate people because we can't expect people to know something they've never been taught about. They've never experienced. So education piece is really important. And we want to have that collaboration between people with different lived experiences um, so that you know in building our you know we often have recruitment drives to bring in diversity into an organization and then people arrive and they're not asked their opinion and don't have that opportunity to engage so we want to create that culture where that intersection actually just runs through everything we do our decision making our policies our procedures and I appreciate not everything can change overnight these things take time but just starting to think about it just starting to trial different ways of working starting to have conversations can really you know get the ball rolling and, and get people on board and you know as we tried to make clear throughout this presentation 
thinking with intersectionality in mind allow us to more accurately identify those barriers we can recognize inequalities and start to address them we're better able to reach a wide range of people and that could be applicants service users customers community groups and we're able to move away from treating people as holding those single characteristics and just start to move towards recognizing them as a whole person and closer to the reality of their experiences in everyday life um, and if this is the aim and the impact you want to make so you know how can you tell if that impact is happening so um, you can incorporate questions into feedback collection for example so you know did you feel that this um, initiative catered for your identity as a whole um, as I just touched on thinking about um, analysing your, your data, so thinking about what you collect throughout um, people's journey with you as an organisation um, and having that intersectional look. Um, service user feedback, community feedback, you can ask along the same lines as you would with internal feedback as well. You want to look at measuring the pay um, progression across that intersectional axis. Um, so Think about all of your kind of feedback opportunities where you measure your impact and build that intersectional lens into it. It's not about creating something new because um, you probably have some good systems and, and ways of approaching things that you can change. But so just have a look and assess how you can build that in. Um, so that is everything from me. Wow. Thank you ever so much. What a whistle stop tour <laughs> and um, what a uh, fun and information packed uh, session that's been um, and there's a lots of thanks and a brilliant session excellent session thank you so much um, yeah it's certainly I think more than anything absolutely heightened people's uh, number one awareness but also uh, thoughts around um, intersectionality so thank you just looking forward to um, the next session it's reverse mentoring so it's kind of taking intersectional intersectionality uh, on a little bit and the topic is around eliminating uh, discrimination one conversation at a time and we've got uh, a lady called uh, Rabina who will be joining us to tell us a bit more about uh, reverse mentoring which is indeed something that we've most recently done within Cornwall Council and Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service. That session will be on the 31st of January so we'll certainly look forward to uh, to those that may join us for that one or, or indeed if you've enjoyed this session and can't make the next one then uh, please kind of pass on uh, your kind of enjoyment levels to others that, that might want to join.